Father, we thank you. Father, we bless you. Father, we honor you. How great you are. How wonderful you are. Lord, there is no one like you. Even at this hour, Spirit of the living God, we invite you. Speak to us right now. Touch us. Fill us. Oh, ye brakash kolomando rosala bayadaba. Siakotama. Oh, pambigua ko goes. Oh, yeah. Tama Sia Katama Say Pamiwa Slet to Mo Slet to Mo Pamiwa Mandush Kala Brandush Kadaba Sia kotama, sia kotama, se pamiwa ko. Oh, we love you, Jesus. We love you, she love. Father, we thank you. We honor you. We bless you. We give you the glory, Lord. We give you the praise. There is no one like you. Spirit of the living God, we welcome you even at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm so great to speak to you on this platform on a restoring word. I greet you all, brothers and sisters. What an honor to gather here. My name is David D. Bungane. I'm a pastor at IM Church, and I'm so glad to speak to you. We are on our subject uh, title, Leaders Are Builders. Leaders are builders. And then uh, our key verse, it says, it found in Matthew 9 verse 37. Truly the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Pray there and ask the Lord of the harvest to send more laborers. So we are talking about leaders. We know that in the house of God, a laborer is a servant. A servant is a leader. So Jesus says we need to pray and ask for more leaders. We live in a days where the church needs leaders more than ever. So we are here to talk about leaders. So I want you to invite someone, take someone, if you know a pastor, an elder, a leader, or someone who's a member at church who would like to uh, join and serve at church, take them with this message of restoring word as we're going to be sharing. So last time we spoke about how to discover leaders and then um, we talk about developing leaders and now we are talking about deploying, how to deploy leaders, how to put leaders into position. Deploying means placing people in right position. And there are three words that are very important when you think about deployment. There is what we call appointment, appointing people, promoting people, and then of course, uh, ordaining people or affirming people. So there are three things that we do at church when we are placing people or when we are deploying people is to appoint them, is to affirm them, which is to promote them, and is to ordain them. So this process, it goes and it follows like that. Now, my uh, uh, leadership experience began at the age of 16. It was back in KZN. I was, uh, 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 because my brother, my older brother was a singer, a recording artist back then. So they asked me to lead a community choir. There was a community choir that we had. And then they said, well, since your brother is a singer, can you also help us and then let's lead this choir? It was a group of older people than me. And then I was very excited over the opportunity. Of course, I said yes. And then a few weeks later, I discovered that people were not coming to rehearsals. People were coming late. At the rehearsals, people were talking. People were not, you know, uh, um, respecting me. And then uh, 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 a month later, people started quitting the choir. 
And I actually, I also decided to quit. I stopped going to the choir and I failed. That was my first leadership opportunity at the age of 16. I failed because I was willing, I had a zeal, but I did not know what to do. The Bible says my people perish because of lack of knowledge. It's not the anointing that we are lacking. It's not the demons that are attacking us. It's because we just don't know what to do. So dear pastor, dear CEO, dear manager, take somebody, let's talk today about appointing right people, talk about uh, uh, training right people, talk about elevating people at church, talk about ordaining people. So some many, many people are eager to lead. When you say, I'm looking for leaders, you're going to get people lifting their hands. But they are clueless. They don't know what does that mean. They don't know what it means to actually be a leader. Strong leaders, uh, 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 they are raised. You know, you, you're not just born a leader. You must be raised, you must be trained, and you must be appointed. Some leaders have become, you know, so out of leading people and out of choosing people, I've seen people starting to lead a church. But guess what? They soon start leading in their businesses. They start leading wherever they go. I have appointed many people at church uh, uh, to lead. And then some of them, they're actually great business owners. Some, they are great in their marriages. Some are doing well leading other churches. Even today, I still believe leaders are a key into an organization. I still raise leaders. When you are a leader in ministry, it doesn't matter you know, uh, 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 if you're a student, it doesn't matter. You're a girl, it doesn't matter. You're young, but you can also be a leader. And to be a leader at church, it doesn't mean that you can't own a business. To be a leader, it doesn't mean that you cannot uh, uh, follow your career dreams. I'm coming from the entertainment world as a, as a recording artist, but yet I'm leading a church. So you can still follow your dreams. To be a leader, it means you, you, you must prioritize your task. Put the ministry first and let other things follow. Always prioritize your task. Leaders are the pillar in an organization. So if you're a leader at church, you are a pillar. When you're not at church, that pillar is shaken or that pillar is not standing. So the church is strong based on the leaders that the church has. A senior pastor must appoint leaders who are faithful, faithful pillars. People will show up even when they're not feeling uh, uh, like showing up, they will have to show up. Whatever department you are in, you have to show up. Uh, um, uh, you must, so it's important that a pastor gives people uh, a structure. Everybody must see that, okay, I belong in this structure. I belong in that position so that you know where to serve and how to serve. Uh, the Lord Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, how to heal the sick, how to deliver people, how to win souls. A pastor's job is to show people and to teach people the basic things about leadership. And then the rest, they will figure out on their own. Now, let's talk about appointing leaders. The first step of deploying people into right position is to appoint them. Look for people who are willing. Look for people who are available. Look for people who want to learn. Look for people who love God, who have their heart after God. After appointing leaders, then you must help them to grow. So growth is not, you don't grow automatically. It must be intentional. You must study. You must listen to tapes. You must be intentional about your growth. Don't give, uh, so don't be quick into promoting people. So when you have appointed someone, let them serve for a particular time and let's see results. Wait for them to produce good results. Do not be quick to lay hands or to uh, promote people. First Timothy 5 verse 22, it says, lay uh, hands suddenly to no man, neither be partakers of their men's sins. Keep yourself pure. Dear pastor, do not promote people too quickly. If you promote or ordain a wrong leader, you are liable you know, uh, uh, for their mistakes. Whatever they do, whatever they say, they're representing the local church, they are representing Christ, but you as a pastor, you are responsible because you have endorsed and elevated this person. If in your team, you have somebody who's misusing money, who's just misusing resources, or who is even shouting at people. Dear pastor, you need to call that person to order because Jesus, you know, uh, uh, in all, when you are reading, you know, the Bible, you don't see Jesus abusive with words. You don't see Jesus shouting at people. You need to raise leaders that are Christ-like, that have the heart of Christ. Amen. It takes time to raise great leaders. Jesus spent three to four years 
discipling or teaching his 12 apostles. Some people will come to church with leadership experience from other churches. Okay? There's no need to demote anybody, but there's no need also to affirm somebody you don't know. I always say retrain, retrain. Let people learn from the new uh, vision that you have. Let them learn and let them study about a local church. You don't have to demote anyone. Leaders must continue with the senior uh, pastor's message. They must help him to carry the vision. The disciples of Jesus, they continue to teach the, uh, the kingdom of God has come. They continue to win people win souls. They continue to heal the sick. So every leader is there to assist the pastor to continue with the vision. Say amen if that makes sense. Now let's talk about promotion. When you want to promote people or you want to elevate people at church. Leaders who are growing and are doing well, they deserve to be promoted. So do not treat everyone in the same way. If this one is performing, elevate them. If this one is still struggling, retrain them. Remember, I said there's no demotion. There is no, you can't say I'm firing you. You can't fire somebody who did not hire. Jesus brings somebody at church to be born again. The job of a pastor is to train. If a person is taking time, retrain. Look at us as leaders, how long did it take for us to accept the call, to be faithful with the call? It takes a long time for one to grow. So leaders who are struggling, they must be moved into maybe another position, another task, but always believe in people. Never ask people to give up. Never chase people out of church because God brought, brought them there. Promotion in ministry is elevation. This means more responsibility. Anyone who's promoted, more work. When I was a music leader for 15 years, serving in three different churches, my work was just rehearsals and sing on Sunday. Rehearsals and sing on Sunday. There was not much I was responsible for. Now, when I became a pastor in 2014, it moved from just uh, rehearsals, sing at church. Now, I had to worry about finances. I had to worry about the word. I had to worry about people's well-being. I had to worry about many things. While I was working my salvation, you know, uh, 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 with fear and trembling growth. So as a pastor, the, my elevation or my promotion came with so much responsibility. And then uh, 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 I'm still responsible at home as a husband and as a father. So to be promoted, there's no need to fight. Don't fight for leaders who are appointed. Uh, uh, don't fight against people who are being ordained. They have been given more responsibility. Amen. Acknowledge those who are do it, doing well publicly, and then those who don't do well, secretly reprimand them. Secret, every time when I'm about to rebuke a person, it has to be done secretly. Why? Because we, that person will improve, and then when they improve, we, shouldn't, we, should, we should not disgrace them in front of other people. So, correct people privately, dear pastor, and then always acknowledge them publicly. John Maxwell says uh, you must acknowledge them while the sweat is still on their face which means don't wait for two months to say you did a great job or oh, three months ago. When a person is doing a great job now be begin to appreciate them, clap hands for them, give them applause while their sweat is still on their face because it means a lot for them to be acknowledged and to be appreciated. Most people start working at church as volunteers. And then uh, 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 they, they must feel appreciated and needed so that they can grow and take more responsibilities. So I want to talk about ordination. Ministry ordination. Now, ordination comes from the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has uh, 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 anointed me. So, anointing is part of being appointed to preach the gospel. Then, ordination is an affirmation of that, uh, uh, of, of, of that uh, uh, anointing. So, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. So, the Holy Spirit is the one that ordains people, is the one that anoints people. Then what does a pastor do? We facilitate the ordination or we facilitate that uh, 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 elevation that the Holy Spirit has made. You cannot ordain yourself. You cannot anoint yourself. You cannot elevate yourself. It is the Lord who calls people to the ministry. You know, uh, uh, and you cannot even say to a person, no, you are not called. Come on, who called you? Any calling is a personal conviction. 
God calls people privately, personally. You will never know. You cannot even say, this one looks like a preacher. This one looks like a prophet. You can't look outside. Jesus already, the word of God, you know, uh, already says uh, uh, um, when, when, when Samuel is coming to ordain uh, uh, in the, the sons of Jesse, he wants to ordain the first guy. And God says, no, this is not the person. Human beings will look at the outside. But Jesus, he sees the heart. Hallelujah. So do not judge people by their appearance and say, this one looks like a prophet. You need to wait for the fruit. Most of all, wait on the Lord. He is the Lord who ordains people. So ordination is not a business adventure. It's not a career uh, adventure where you say, I'm just going to try it out. If it doesn't work, I'm going to stop. An ordination or a calling is a lifetime commitment to serve God and serve people. Very important. No one can stop a person from who, who, who is called. No one can stop a person if they say they are called. A calling is always a personal conviction. Now, there are four noticeable uh, ordination in the Bible. There, are, there is deacons. Now, deacons, these are ministry leaders. In Acts 6, verse 3, uh, they say, look out. Uh, for seven men that we can uh, appoint uh, over the work. And that's where we have Philip and Stefan. Those are deacons. And another ordination is the ordination of elders. These are church leaders. So elders, they work with pastors. Where the church, maybe a church branch that doesn't have a pastor, elders, then they have that authority. In the book of uh, uh, Titus 1 verse 5, and then um, you see elders being appointed. And another ordination is the ordination of pastors. When I say pastors, I'm talking about the whole fivefold. Uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Ephesians 4 from 11 to 12. And another ordination that we see is bishops. These are ministry overseers. They tend to work with pastors. They tend to assist pastors or the fivefold to do the work. In 1 Timothy 3 from 1 to 2. These are bishops. So this is another ordination. But I want to just caution you about something. The Babylon uh, uh, system, it, it, it's against the church. The Babylon system, it represents the worldly system. So when you read in the book of Daniel 1 verse 3 to 4, you hear about how uh, uh, when uh, the, 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 the nation of Babylon was taking over the world, what they did to Jerusalem, what they did to church. Jerusalem represents the church. Babylon represents the world at that time. So let's read Daniel 1 from 3 to 4. It says what? And the king spake unto uh, Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that uh, he should bring a certain of the children of Israel and uh, of the king's seed and the princes, children uh, in uh, whom there was no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in a king's palace and whom they might teach the language and the tongue of Chaldeans. Now, this was the order. The world is always going to church to take what is a church, what has been trained, what has been discovered, and then take it to the world. So the Babylonian system, they were there to kidnap, they were there to conquer, and they were taking some of these things that were church. Now, the Babylon system is a worldly system that is against the church. It destroys leaders in the church. The Babylon system, it destroys pastors. The Babylon system wants to remove the vessels and the treasures in the house of God. All the resources must be removed out of the house of God. It steals believers away from the church. All right? It, it makes sure that people don't belong in any church. That's why... You have many people who say, I have a church back home. But they mean that uh, a, a church where they go maybe on holidays in December or in June, whenever they take a holiday, but they don't have a church. They visit church one, church two, church three, some because they serve in a church, especially those who are in, the, in arts. They, they visit a lot of church because they are needed. I mean, I'm in Asha for this church in two months, and then after that, I'm not happy. I'm going to move to the other church. 
and then I can't commit to any church because my church is back home. But that's a spirit of Babylon. The spirit of Babylon doesn't want people to commit. You know, I've heard of pastors who are complaining about people who are serving in churches. It says, why do you have to uh, uh, go to these churches in a city? You must stay loyal to the church in a rural home or back home where you come from, your parents' church. But that's not the right way. When somebody goes and then they are in a city or they move to another province, they must find a local church there. They must belong in another church there. They must serve, they must tithe, they must love the Lord, they must grow in that church. You cannot always complain and say people must come back and they must stay at home. Now, if I can say to anyone who's coming to your church, what if I tell them that, no, you must belong where you come from. Belong in your church back home. Give in your church back home. Wherever you go, just be a visitor. It cannot be like that. The body of Christ is one. If somebody is from Cape Town and now is in Johannesburg, in Johannesburg you must find a church and you must submit there. If you are in Durban, find a church, you must submit there. There is no pastor who has a claim of saying, this is my ship. This is my member, and no one can remove them from me. They are mine forever as long as they live. We are all belonging to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our chief shepherd. We all belong to him. Amen. So the spirit of Babylon is the one that removes people from church. The spirit of Babylon, it kills future leaders. These are the, uh, the prince. These are the seeds uh, 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 that were in Jerusalem. It says, remove them. Let's kidnap them. Let's take them. Let's teach them the language of Babylon. Let's give them a doctrine of Babylon. Remove them from Jerusalem. Remove them from the house of God. Now, leaders or the prince here, it represents future pastors, future preachers. Every time when people are growing well at church, Jesus is looking for a laborer in them. If you're a musician and then you are leading powerfully, Jesus wants you to be a pastor. Jesus wants you to be a preacher. Jesus wants you to be an evangelist. He wants you to be a prophet. That's how we all must grow, to have a ministry of a fivefold and to serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Chase out the enemy now, he wants to chase out talent from church. How many of you have noticed that um, some of the most talented people start at church, but they don't start, they don't end at church? Some of the most famous artists that we know about, they, they, they would say, they, they gladly say, I started singing in a choir. I started singing in a church. But as soon as they got a recording deal, as soon as they had an opportunity, they left the church. Why is it so? The Babylon system doesn't want to see talented people remaining at church. In fact, if you remain at church, you are ridiculed. To say, what a waste. The, the, the talent is wasted. The gift is wasted. If you are out there, you know, you, you, you'll be making so much money. You will, be, you will use your gift. You will make a living out of your gift. But that's the enemy enticing you to leave the house of God. Come on, dear brother, dear sister, you are beautiful. You are talented. You are anointed. Remain in Jerusalem. Remain in the house of God. Remain in serving in ministry. Yes, you can still uh, be in a marketplace. You can still be in entertainment. But every Sunday... Every person must belong in their local church. Somebody say amen. And the last one, very important. Now, the enemy wants to remove wise and educated people from the church. Wise, educated. Okay, so wise and educated, these are business people. These are financially strong people. At church, everyone who comes there, it must be a person who doesn't, who doesn't have a jobless person, a person who's sick, a person who's going through problems, a person who's distressed. Where are the wise people? Where are the educated people? Where are the financially strong people? The enemy doesn't want them to stay there. The enemy will bring offense. They will be offended at the, preach, at the preacher's message. They will be offended at the preacher's leadership style. They will be offended at the preacher's uh, uh, leadership team. And the person says, I can't take this and I'm leaving. I want you, to, I just want to encourage you. The spirit of Babylon, the spirit of the world, it doesn't want to see educated people at church. It doesn't want to see talented people at church. In fact, they get so angry, say, after all that I've done at church, no one is acknowledging me. No one is appreciating me. I'm going to go to the world where I'm appreciated. But the devil is a liar. I want to just pray for you right now. Now, today we spoke about appointing. We spoke about uh, 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 deploying. It is very important for you to understand. 
You cannot just start and then next thing you are promoted. You will be appointed first. We'll give you some time to grow. By the fruit, as you are producing the fruit, then you will be elevated. Where there are no fruit of the Spirit, where there's no patience, where there is no self-control, where there is no kindness, you cannot be promoted. You must remain there, keep being trained, keep being taught. Even if you are fine, you have a lot of money. The fruit of the Spirit are a key to be elevated in the house of God. I want to just encourage somebody here who's being promoted. When you are being promoted, it's not because you are better than other people. It's not because you are highly anointed than other people. Being promoted, it just means we are giving you more responsibility. You know, we are giving you more work because you are doing very well. Now, I want you to look at this when you think about church. When you are a leader, you are a leader to other leaders. Anyone you win to Christ, if they grow, they become faithful with little and God raised them. And let's say they accept the call and they plant a church. Now you see, you want them to Christ, but because you are not growing, they have grown to be preachers. They have grown to have a ministry. Now God has elevated them. In terms of the stature, they have outgrown you. See, growth, it's, it's up to you. You cannot blame your pastor. You cannot blame your surrounding. You have to produce the fruits of the Spirit. So, you are being promoted today. You are being promoted, but the question is, are you faithful with what you've been given? Ordination is coming. And this ordination, don't say no. Somebody said to me, how do I know I'm ready to be ordained? Well, it's the Holy Spirit who ordains people. He's the Holy Spirit who anoints people. The pastor's job is to facilitate. You need to show the fruit. And the fruit of the Spirit, they show that this person is ready to be elevated. So I want us to pray now. As I pray, I want you to ask the Lord and say, Lord, help me. I want to desire to serve. I want to serve you again. I want to be a servant in the house of God. I want to be a child of God. And I want to do well again. I want to serve you. So I want us to pray wherever you are. Ask the Lord to touch you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for my brother. I thank you for my sister. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray now. Father, I pray for my sister, oh Lord God, who wants to serve, but they've been discouraged. The enemy has whispered words in them. You are caught up in the Babylon system. Now it's time to turn back to God. It is time to serve God wholeheartedly. In the name of Jesus, I pray now. If you are listening to me, maybe you are not born again. You say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want you to be saved. I want you to surrender your life to Jesus. Would you make this prayer after me? Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Say, Lord, I believe you are the Son of God. You died and you rose again for my sins. Write my name in a book of life. Today, I want to be born again. I receive you as a Lord and Savior over my life. Father, I thank you. Now, if you made that prayer, I want you to know that you are born again and today you are a child of God. Please join a ministry. Serve in a ministry. It is time to be deployed. It is time to be sent. May God bless you. May God bless you. And to those who would like to give, please, the information is given. You, may you give as we are preaching the gospel to continue to advance the gospel. May God bless you with your seed and we look forward to see you next time. God bless you.